found out it was going to be on the water. It was coming from the bottom. I've never seen it before. And we had it a while. Um, it was looking somewhere in the bottom, so it was just kind of seeping out of the bottom. But it was kind of pouring out to begin with. So we were like, yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And the pets were like 125 gallons. I free fish out of it, which was in hindsight not a good idea because I kind of like to catch them out there. <laughs>
Last week, I have a few copies of the outline from last week. We'll be continuing in that uh, today. So, uh, anybody need one? Maybe we wasn't here last week. Thank you. Yes, I got another one. Okay, you got I got you. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, we'll get going into uh, Acts chapter 7, so uh, before you, we do that, you would uh, bow with me for a word of prayer. Our God, our Father, we're certainly thankful for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us and being able to assemble here to uh, uh, engage in a period of study of your word. We pray, Father, that you will bless us as we do that and we thank you for it and we thank you for the examples that we find in the book of Acts that we can learn from and we're uh, glad to be able to learn about the early church and the things that they went through and we pray, Father, will be strengthened as a result of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, last week, uh, we were in chapter, we spent most of our time in chapter 6, and uh, we were introduced to a man 
by the name of Stephen. And uh, Stephen, uh, for the next, for chapter 6 and 7, obviously plays a very prominent role. And we know that the church at this time is, uh, is still new, relatively new. It is still confined to the area of Jerusalem, and, uh, but that is getting ready to change. It's probably, the church at this time is probably five, six years old uh, at, at this point. And, and we talked about how uh, Stephen was one of the seven that was chosen uh, to, uh, to help out uh, the, in the uh, situation that had arisen where the, some of the widows uh, had been uh, apparently neglected. But then he moves on from dealing with that uh, to becoming a very bold preacher. And uh, that's talked about in the uh, second half of, uh, of chapter 6. And he's so bold and he's so uh, effective uh, in debates and, and in his teaching and in his preaching. And we also find out that he has been bestowed the, uh, the ability to perform miracles and signs. And, and so he's really stirring up uh, the governing body there and as a result we saw where he was arrested now uh, for uh, uh, should I use orange Gary in honor of Tennessee's victory <laughs> I'm not going to do that uh, I will never do that okay but uh, uh, <laughs> black for favor there you okay go. yeah there we go no yeah. one second there we go um, um, but uh, so he, he was charged basically with four things, right? We talked about that last week, and uh, that that uh, they had accused him of one, and it was all related to uh, this word called blasphemy, which we know in that day and time among the Jewish people that was a big deal, right? Okay, that this, this right here uh, is a very very serious offense. So he was accused of blaspheming. I think there was uh, maybe. There were four things he was uh, charged with. One was what? Moses. Moses. Okay, he blasphemed against Moses. Okay. Who else? What else? God. God. Okay. All right. The law. The law. Okay. Which was the law of Moses, right? So Moses himself, God. The law of Moses and what else? It was a big deal to those folks. <coughs> the temple, right? Okay. All right. Those were very uh, serious charges, and uh, of course they were you know, not accurate. He did not blaspheme any of these things. But uh, as as we as we're going to see here, and so he's arrested, and uh, now he is before uh, the uh, Sanhedrin. And verse one of chapter seven says, "Then the high priest said, Are these things so?'" So now. He has an opportunity to defend himself. Now, the way he goes about defending himself, uh, he's defending Christianity. He's defending Christ. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he makes a defense of all these, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, all these that they have charged him with blasphemy, he actually makes a defense of them as well. And uh, so last week, whenever we left off, we had just, he, and he starts this with a little history lesson for them. And we are not told in chapter 6 exactly what he was preaching that uh, got them all stirred up, but we get hints by his defense uh, that he gives here in chapter 7. And so we started reading last week the historical account that he gave the, uh, the Sanhedrin that he was before at this time. Uh, and um, uh, so the first, I think, about 16 verses, he, he's basically talking about the patriarchal age. Uh, he talks about the promise of Abraham, uh, and then also the, uh, the 12 patriarchs, uh, and uh, talks about uh, Jacob and Joseph uh, through the first uh, 16 verses. And we started reading, we got down to about verse 30, but I'm going to back up just a little bit and transition to where it goes from talking about the patriarchal age to the Mosaic age. And uh, so let's go back and start with about verse 17 there um, of uh, chapter 7. Anything anybody wants to bring up before we, get, uh, before we dive into that? But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, 
the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. So, uh, and you can go to the book of Numbers and uh, kind of get those uh, details as far as the numbers, uh, as far as the population that had grown uh, during this period of time. Uh, but it was estimated by the time that they uh, left Egypt that, uh, you know, by the time you calculate, the, they, they talk about those of military age men, which would be men 20 years and over. Uh, and, uh, but by the time you, you know, make some assumptions, some conservative assumptions about, you know, wives and children and all that, probably around 2 million people is what uh, some scholars I've read have, have kind of come up with. But it says in verse 18, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. Uh, this man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they may might not live. We talked a little bit about that last week. Very similar to what was going on in, uh, in Bethlehem uh, in that area when Jesus was born. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And we talked a little bit last week about how that appears to be a contradiction with a, an excuse that Moses made uh, whenever uh, God was uh, giving him his uh, marching orders, which was what? I'm slow to speech. I can't. But it says here he's mighty in words and deeds. Uh, but it says when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart. Uh, keep in mind the context here. Stephen is before the Sanhedrin. And he's giving his defense. Uh, and uh, and, and kind of going back and giving them a historical. Because, I mean, they're real proud of their history, right? The, the, the Jewish people, they're, they're really proud uh, of this history of, of their forefathers. And it says, now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and uh, the, the, the slaves there. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. So he, he killed an Egyptian there because he was, uh, uh, he was uh, not uh, dealing well with the Israelite. Uh, for he supposed, and I want you to look at this particular verse here, verse 25. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Uh, it says, and the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, men and brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? So he's making a point that for many generations, uh, our forefathers rejected Moses. Okay? You're accusing me of blaspheming Moses, but our people have a long history of rejecting Moses. And uh, the, the first example is uh, when he tries to uh, uh, you know, reconcile these, uh, these Israelites and they push him away. But... Uh, one of the things that I was kind of interested in getting your thoughts regarding is verse 25. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, and they did not understand. Now, keep in mind, this is before, well before, uh, you know, God is talking to Moses and gives him this uh, order to, you know, lead the people out of Egypt. Why would he have thought that here at this time? He was an Israelite in the, in the house of Pharaoh, basically. Okay, okay. So it says that, that he would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So he approached this thinking that, uh, that he would have credibility among them because he was a an Israelite in in the house uh, in the house of Pharaoh. Okay, all right. Any other thoughts on that? Promises. Promises. Okay. Promises that have been given back in Genesis to okay. Abraham. You know. Okay. I was just curious your thoughts as to why you know Moses would have thought at this time. You know, he's forty years old. He hasn't uh, 
you know, this is many years before uh, he's leading them out of Egypt, why he would assume that they would understand that he is the one to deliver them. Yeah. One can understand why they didn't. Okay. If you think about just human nature, you know, here's one of our people, but uh -huh. he's up there with them. He he doesn't care anything about us. He's, okay. He thinks he's an Egyptian now. Okay. okay. Right? You know, he's got power. He's got influence. And we don't see him doing anything. Yeah. To help us. So he made an assumption that because he was in the house of Pharaoh, that, that, uh, that they, that, would, that know, they yes. would have a more favorable because uh, he is an Israelite. That right. he would, that he's but one of theirs. Human but, nature uh, wouldn't really necessarily mean that. Right. Okay. All right. That's a good comment, David. Chris. Yeah. Maybe it's a more limited thing here. Maybe what uh, Stephen is saying is those two guys. Mm -hmm. Thought that he, I mean, he that Moses thought that they would understand. Mm -hmm. But what they understood was they they seen the inconsistency in him, and the, the other things that were said, I believe, also was true. Yeah, um, he was ready, but God wasn't ready for him. Right. When God was ready, maybe he wasn't quite exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think those are excellent comments. <laughs> yeah, all of them. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Hey, Chris. Yes, yes, sir. He might have thought that they understood it because just the day before he had, or just right before that, he had stood up for them by killing them Egyptian. Oh, there you go. Okay, good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had already shown kind of his, his, you know, where his leanings were, right? He, he, he had shown uh, about his actions just, just the day before. Uh, you know. And uh, so he thought that, uh, yeah. I think he thought that would carry some weight that apparently it did not. Okay. Good. Good comments. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Okay. Um, it says, uh, verse 28, Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, well, that's a real turning point there in the life of Moses, right? Why? Because the word's out. And he realizes the word is out. That uh, he had he had done this and killed the Egyptian, which would mean trouble for him. And so, as a result, in verse 29, then uh, at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And of course, he was there for quite a while. Uh, as we continue reading uh, here about it, the defense that he's giving in this history lesson, and when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Um, so, okay, so he was, he was 40 years old when he slayed the Egyptian, right? I think we were told that. Here's another 40 years that's gone by. It says, when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Um, it, you notice here the, the, the words here. He, he's in the presence of God. It says, and he trembled and dare not look. Uh, I think that's interesting wording there. He trembled. Why would he tremble? I think he realizes the greatness of God, right? The, the, the awe of being of, of God. And uh, the fact that uh, you know uh, what he's what he's seeing, he's just he's just overwhelmed and overcome here. And uh, he says, "Then the Lord said to him, Take sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Having surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them." Now remember, God's working out His plan. God's working out His plan. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Uh, he, he is uh, defending himself against this charge of uh, blaspheming Moses. Then Moses, whom they rejected, and remember he gets that point in there, your forefathers and mine, he says, uh, rejected, rejected Moses, the very one you're accusing me of blaspheming. Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. 
he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for years. So, you know, Moses also had to utilize miracles and wonders and signs. And those are used for what purpose we've talked about? To confirm what he said is true, right? Confirm what he said is true. And so he wraps up his defense here of, uh, of the accusation of blaspheming Moses here in, in these uh, following verses here. He says, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Okay, so he's telling them, Okay, the, the, the one that you're accusing me of blaspheming, he, he said the exact same thing that, that I'm saying. That he, he said that there's going to be a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. Okay? Uh, and then that goes right along with Matthew chapter 5. If you would uh, turn over to Matthew chapter 5 just for a second. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. You'll recall here on this, uh, in this Sermon on the Mount. Here Jesus says, uh, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that goes right along with what uh, Stephen is saying here uh, in verse 37, that God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. And here he's, you know, th these uh, individuals are so, you know, uh, educated in the law, well, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 to them. And so uh, a very, very powerful defense that he's given for himself. He's going to raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. He's telling them, hey, Moses pointed to Jesus as well. Okay, uh, Moses pointed to it. Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Um, this is he, verse 38 who was in the congregation of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. So in the, in the bush there, where we're getting the... I'm going to ask another question here. Uh, okay, here's the bush. Was it God or was it an angel? I mean, keep saying angel here. What, what was it? Was it God or an angel? It also says God spoke to him. So. Okay. God spoke to him. Okay. I told him who he was. Uh huh. Uh, but it also says an angel came to him. Maybe he brought him to him. Okay. Right. That's good. Any He's other thoughts? He's holy ground, so God makes it holy. Not there had angel. to be deity there, right? Okay. God is what makes it holy, right? What is an angel? Messenger. A messenger? Probably both. Okay. Probably both. It, it could be the angel of the Lord, uh, which is Jesus, Jesus before he came in the flesh. Yeah. yeah. We have many such manifestations right. in the Old Testament. We'll start with Hagar in Genesis 16. Yeah. Coming forward. And yeah. uh, Jesus eight times in the book of John says, I am. Mm hmm Right. Uh, he is he is the I am. Right. And so he's part of the Godhead, so Absolutely. that reconciles it pretty heavy. Absolutely. 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 That, those, those are good. That's good. See that's what I do if I don't understand something like that. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, twice so far you've just come through like champions here. Uh, okay, so and then in verse thirty eight, or let's see, what did I get to? Yeah, verse thirty eight. This is he who was in the congregation. This isn't a congregation, it's not a church congregation, right? The church at that point had not been established yet. In the wilderness, with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers, okay, he's talking about their ancestors and his ancestors, he says, our, our fathers would not obey, but not only did they not obey, they rejected, okay? So, all right, so our forefathers, you're accusing me of doing the same thing that your forefathers did. And in the hearts, the, and in their hearts, they turned back 
to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Uh, you know, and we'll say that too sometimes. About well, I don't know what's come of so and so, whatever. And he says, and they made, and they didn't know what had come of Moses. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. I find forty-two very interesting. He says, then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Uh, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And he goes and, and he quotes Amos chapter 5 here. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness of the house of Israel? You also took up the table of Moloch and the star of the god Remphan images which you made to worship and I will carry you away uh, beyond Babylon. Uh, you notice what he says in verse 42. He says, God turned and gave them up to worship these things. Uh, you know, God's not going to force us to obey Him, right? He's not going to force us to accept Christ. He's not going to force us to be obedient uh, to His Word. He gives us uh, He gives us a choice, and uh, He gave them a choice, and uh, and so often they they chose incorrectly. Um, so there's His defense uh, as as the, of the charge of blaspheming. Uh, Moses. So uh, we looked at the patriarchal age in, in, his, in his historical recounting here. We looked at the patriarchal age that had to be part of what he was preaching is these different dispensations of time. The patriarchal age and he goes into the Mosaic age and then he goes into the Christian age. And then he turns his attention uh, here in verse 44 as part of his as part of this defense. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, uh, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. And you'll read about that, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 8, or through 8, rather, 1 Kings 5 through 8. However, the Most High did not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and here he's going to quote Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? All right, so now he's going into his defense where not only did he not, actually he uh, defended himself first from um, count one and count three of the indictment. Now he's talking about count four. Uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't understand that neither the temple or the tabernacle, uh, they were not intended to be permanent. As a matter of fact, the temple was not permanent. AD 70 just destroyed it. But uh, they were never intended to be permanent. They were intended uh, for a time that suited God's plan. Okay? And as he's carrying out his plan, and, uh, and we, we, we see that with the tabernacle and also uh, the temple. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is also referenced as far as, uh, you, you remember the conversation Jesus had with the woman at the well? Um, you know, they they started having this discussion and uh, talking about where they would worship. Now, what brought that up is Jesus uh, tells her about her ungodly lifestyle that she's living uh, with her multiplicity of husbands and, and all that, and the one that you now live with is not your own. And she says, oh, I perceive your problem. And she changes the subject really quickly. You know, we, we like to do the same thing. You know, when, when we're hearing something we don't like or we're a little uncomfortable with a particular topic, we'll change the subject. Well, that's what she did. And she goes into this discussion of, uh, of worship. Well, uh, I've heard that you're supposed to worship here or worship here. What did Jesus say? It's, not, it's going to come a time when it's not going to be about where. It's going to be about how, Right? Uh, God is spirit. You must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 
So, uh, and so there he, he's making the point here that the temple, the tabernacle, never meant to be permanent. Never meant to be permanent. Now, they're not liking this. And it, it's probably pretty clear that he is getting pushback from this Sanhedrin of about 70, was it 70 or 71 members of the Sanhedrin? Uh, I'm sure a very intimidating body. Uh, and, and he's here before them. And I'm sure he's getting resistance because if you'll notice, he's re he really changes his tone uh, when he gets to verse 51. Uh, so he, he, he's offered up his defense. And of course, obviously he's not blaspheming God he, he, you know, at, at all. And so he's defending himself on all four of these counts. And now he goes in for the, I guess you'd say, goes in for the kill shot here. He says, you stiff-necked, and again, you, you have to say there's probably some murmuring. They're, they're probably pushing back on, on the things that he's saying because this is really insulting to them. I mean, they're, they're not going to like this. Uh, they're, not, they're not going to like this at all. He says, so you stiff-necked and... Uh, now, what's it mean to be stiff-necked? Stubborn. Stubborn. You can't tell them anything. You, 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 you give them the evidence and they still won't believe it. Uh, just just uh, unteachable, unteachable. And, oh, look at this word that he uses. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. Mm. Who were the uncircumcised? Did he just, did he make a comparison here to these, these elite Jews that you're like Gentiles? How do you think that would go? We'll get ready to find out. You are circumcised in heart and ears. Uh, in other words, they're, they're they're corrupt. They, they, they won't they won't listen. They they, they won't uh, they won't uh, be obedient to what the, the evidence that he's given them. You always resist the Holy Spirit, as did your fathers. So do you. So, not only uh, you know he, he insulted them. And he ins insulted the generations that came before them. It's like insulting you and insulting your parents and insulting your grandparents and your great-grandparents and on and on and on. And uh, so this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, it, it's going to get bad. All right, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. Of whom you now have become. Well now, he, now he's going to accuse them of uh, murdering the Son of God, which they did, right? You have become the betrayers and the murderers. So, uh, so they've accused him, and now he's accusing them. Who have received the law by the directions of angels and have not kept it? Angels again, a messenger. And they've not kept it. So he goes into this. He, he goes into he, he he sets the table with the historical context, and then he goes in and and makes application. You know you you uh, you know Neil knows and you know, preaching a sermon. You you give the information, and then you go in for the application. Right? How does this apply? <laughs> And uh, so he gave them the information, going back to Abraham, going back to Jacob, going back to Joseph, uh, going back to Moses, and, and all that. And uh, and then he ends with he, he talks about Christ and how they're pointing to Christ, and then he applies it to them in a very uh, we'll say straightforward manner. And so when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now, there, we also saw that wording cut to the heart in, um, uh, earlier in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, right, toward the end of Acts chapter 2. But, uh, uh, but I think it was a little different, uh, a little different cut to the heart, right? Um, My footnotes got furious. <laughs> what's that? My footnotes is furious. Furious, uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, they were, they were cut to the heart. But it was a it was a much different emotion than the cut to the heart here. 
uh, in Acts 2, it was an emotion of, of uh, sorrow, right? Uh, of uh, regret. Um, this is an emotion of anger, furious, okay? To the point, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. So apparently they're coming out of their, they're coming out of their, uh, uh, their, from their desk, their exalted positions that they're sitting in, and uh, they're at him and they're gnashing at him with their teeth. Now you really got to be upset to do that. Uh, whenever I was a kid, I had a cousin that liked to do that. And, uh, I think I still got some scars. But, uh, but I mean, you really got to be mad. You know, it, it's one of the things that they did whenever they were just furious. They gnashed him with their teeth. But he, and look, and here's how he responds. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Uh, well, one thing I noticed there, you know, we usually hear about Jesus seated at the right hand of God. Here he's standing, he says, and said, look, see the... Oh, this is really going to get him. Look, see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Meaning that he can see things that they can't see. That, that he's able to see God and his, and his Son Jesus, and uh, they're not able to see that. And uh, it, and it gives reference to Jesus. The, he says, "The Son of Man, the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God." And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. Now here is where all decorum and all uh, uh, proper procedure is, uh, is done away with, right? Uh, they ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses, the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now here we're introduced to Saul, who is going, as we know, is going to play a very prominent role uh, throughout later in the book of Acts and throughout the uh, and throughout the New Testament. And they stoned Stephen, and as he was calling on God and saying, "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Where have we heard statements like that before? Yeah. Uh, go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Same author. Luke chapter 23. And um, look at what Jesus says in verse 34. As he's dying on the cross, verse 34, it says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then look, uh, look at verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So you see parallels here, in the, at the end of Acts chapter, at the end of Acts chapter seven. Uh, I find I, I find this interesting. The, these last two verses, it said, as they stoned Stephen, he was calling on God and saying, "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." Uh, of course, what's he talking about there? The spirit is soul, right? I mean, we're we we all have a physical body, right? I have a physical body, uh, but we also all have a, a soul, right? So you're like, well, yeah, obviously, but uh, he says you receive my spirit because we know that he he knows he's dying, and Neil had a masterful lesson um, about. Christians and death, and uh, our attitude toward death, 
And I think you could also get a lot of comfort here as well. Even though the church is being, uh, it, this is the beginning uh, of, of the ramping up of the persecution uh, where someone actually dies uh, for the cause of Christ. But he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And, and we know that, uh, you know, he, he, he's dying a cruel death. But he also knows that he's getting ready to be with Christ. Uh, he says, Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And, uh, and you know, we can take comfort in that as well, right? Uh, it kind of reminded me of what Paul said in the book of Philippians. If you want to look at that, uh, Philippians chapter 1. And uh, let's go down to uh, about verse 21 of the book of Philippians chapter 1. Um, he says, for, me to, uh, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 22 says, but if I live on in the flesh, what you're seeing Paul doing here is kind of having an internal debate in his mind like, uh, you know, I, I, I'd really like to go on and be with the Lord, uh, but I've got some work to do here. He says, but I live on the flesh. This will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. And look what he says. Which is far better. It's far better. So we can take comfort in that, that when we draw our last breath, and our spirit goes to be with Christ, our body uh, goes through a decaying process, until such time as Christ comes back and we're resurrected to be with God forever, uh, we can take comfort in this. That those that, that are our loved ones that died in Christ, their situation is, as Paul says, far better, far better than, 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 uh, than what we have here on earth. Anybody have any comments or questions on that? Yes. It's not exactly about that part, but um, when he says that he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and then he tells them, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I wonder if they didn't appreciate that also because he had just said Moses, when he heard the voice of the Lord, turned away and trembled. He didn't want to look, and he has an opportunity to look up, and he gets to see the glory of God. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment. That, that, that's good. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, that's good. That's really good. Any other comments on that? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see what, okay. okay. Uh, let's go ahead and dip our toe into chapter 8. Of course, what we see here is, uh, you know, things are, things are escalating. As far as the church is concerned, and of course we we've gotten several growth reports so far of the numbers and such that uh, uh, you know they're coming to Christ and the church is growing, and doing really well, and but then this happens. This is what happens with Stephen, and uh, and then it uh, goes into a discussion about Saul. He says, uh, verse one. Now Saul was consenting to his death. Now, how did he consent? Well, he he, uh, he basically he says they laid their outer garment. The witnesses that were getting ready to stone uh, Stephen, they laid their outer garments. Uh, he was in charge of kind of watching after that, which is a sign of approval of what they're doing. Uh, and of course, they re they remove their outer garments in order to you know free them up to throw. And uh, it, it, so Saul was obviously consenting to that. It says, at that time, and now we're seeing a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Now, remember, uh, the church at this time is still concentrated in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered, but would do this persecution throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So, uh, you know, you've got... Uh, 
Let's see, you've got Israel here, and uh, <coughs> Judea here, you've got Samaria here, and uh, you've got uh, the region of Galilee here, and uh, this is the Mediterranean Sea, <coughs> that's the wall right there. Uh, so, and so now they're, they're uh, in Judea, and they're, they're heading north here, okay? And uh, into, uh, into Samaria. Now, th this goes right along with what they were told would happen in uh, Acts chapter 1 by Jesus, right? Uh, if you want to look back there, Acts chapter 1, uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, uh, look at verse 8. <laughs> but you will re shall receive power from the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, okay, uh, and uh, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Uh, what's the significance about uh, the Jews and the Samaritans and their interactions? Well, we learn about that in John chapter 4, right? When Jesus is having the conversation with the Samaritan woman, she's like, why are you talking to me? Uh, everybody knows that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Why? Well, what? Basically, they were half-breeds. Right, okay. Right. They, they had intermarried with, these, uh, with those uncircumcised Gentiles, right? Uh, and uh, so there was, uh, there, there was a lot of animosity there. Uh, between the two. Uh, in verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Uh, as for Saul, as, as, that we've been introduced to, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. You know, we've talked before about the, the massive change in Peter uh, over this period of time, you know, from the time that he was with Jesus to the time of Jesus' ascension, and then, you know, preaching the uh, in, in the book of Acts here and the change that took place in him. What about this change of Saul? Pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. All right. Uh, anybody have any comments? I tell you what, I think we will stop there and uh, we'll pick up there. Uh, they're in chapter 8 uh, next week. Any comments or anything you want to All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.